study number 44, Revelation chapter 19. And we are pretty well now coming to the close uh, of our series of studies on Bible prophecy, and in particular this book of Revelation that we have been going through. And chapter 19 is a great chapter, and we will learn uh, some things from this chapter as far as future events is concerned that is yet to happen. Although, as Brother Melvin said tonight, the Lord could come any time. He really could. I believe that we are that close. And I believe that the signs, uh, there's nothing else that has to be fulfilled before the Lord can come. And I do believe that the next great thing will be the rapture of the church, which is a subject that a lot do not understand. Uh, And actually, they're not even looking for a rapture. They're looking for an antichrist or a mark of some sort. Well, actually, it's not some sort, but it's 666. But we know that the Bible truth of it is, is that there will be a rapture before the revelation of the Antichrist. And we'll see that even in this chapter of 19. So, uh, beginning in this chapter, verse 1 through 3, uh, and the writer John says, and after these things, and he's making reference to the two previous chapters, 17 and 18 when he said that, and that was uh, the raising up of the political beast, which is the Antichrist, and the religious beast, which we studied and found out that she was labeled as a great whore. And she is destroyed. And it is after these things, after the destruction of that religious system that he's talking about, he said, and after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. Now, in chapter 19, there's people in heaven, right? It has to be the church, the raptured bride. And again, in those that teach a post-trib tribulation doctrine, I don't know how they can read scriptures like this. When, when he says, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. That's where they are, as opposed to being here on earth. And it can't be anybody else other than the raptured church of Jesus Christ. Another biblical proof of a pre-trib rapture. And they will be saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore. He's done that in the previous chapter, the destruction which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again, if you remember our lesson, Rome uh, was a more of a destructive force to the church, the apostolic movement that began almost 2,000 years ago with the apostles, than any other government that was to ever exist. Rome was, and we proved that in chapter, uh, in the last couple of chapters. And again they said, Hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And that is another reason that why that people ought to really take a serious look at what church they belong to, what affiliation they're associated with, what they believe as a doctrine, because this is a heaven or a hell issue. If one is not truly born again, exactly the way the Bible says, they cannot be saved. And it's amazing to me how that there are people that spend 30, 40, 50, 60 years in the nominal churches that are not right and die in them only to be lost. Is that not sad? I don't know if... if, if Truly in their heart, they just, they just can't accept that God is the God that this Bible says that He is, and that He is a God of severity. As Paul said, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. 
I, I wonder, have they not read of the great flood and how God drowned the population of the earth, men, women, and children? Have they not read about the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the destruction and how God literally rained fire down from heaven upon the inhabitants of that cities and plains round about and burnt them with fire? Don't they know that he said, I am the Lord, and I change not? But it seems as though they, they have got the thought process that God's not that evil, that God wouldn't do such a thing. But he's such a God of love that everybody is going to be saved. And that is the philosophy of religion today, that it doesn't really matter what you believe. Just go to church somewhere, belong somewhere, profess something, and it'll save you, which is absolutely not true. But people are deceived and being deceived by the hundreds of thousands in religion. It is really, really sad. And the saddest part about it is, he gave us a book that we could read from with clear and precise instructions on exactly what to do. Yet, I don't know. I don't know. You can't get an answer out of it. I, this is the way my mother and father believe. It's the way I believe. It's the way my grandfather and grandma believed, and they died in it. You never convinced me they went to hell. That's exactly what they say. I want to tell you something. If my mom and daddy both went to hell, I wouldn't want to go with them. If all of my grandpas and grandmas on both sides of the fence went to hell, I don't want to go with them. If my children don't make it, I still want to make it. I mean, this is about me. I don't want to die and go to hell. And if my parents choose so, or my children choose so, then that is a foolish decision that they make. That's why the Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is a personal thing. It really is. And I'll tell you this. Anyone that is lost, it is nobody's fault but their own. Nobody. Verse 4 and 5. And the four and twenty elders, which are, by the way, also in heaven, and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne. Now, who's sitting on the throne? The Bible says here, God. And we have proved in Scripture in other places that it's Jesus Christ. God and Jesus Christ is one and the same. It is no wonder that the Lord said in the, on the day of judgment, when man stands before him, that they would be without excuse. This Bible is so plain that there is one God and that Jesus Christ is that God and there's only one name under heaven whereby we must be saved and it's the name of Jesus Christ and the way of holiness that it is so plain that the Bible says, though a man be a fool, he shall not err therein. If one wants to know the truth, God will show it to us. So again, everybody that goes to hell deserves it. It's true, and I've got family members that passed on that they, they don't have a chance to make it. I mean, they didn't leave behind nothing but a sad song. They didn't make it, you see. But it won't change the word of the Lord. The Bible is the right. And it don't change for you or me or my family or yours. That's why I'm in this for Ronnie Walker. Now, I'm going to try to help all you folk get there. Is that all right? And I'm going to tell you the truth. And what would it profit me to lie to you <laughs> and tell you, Anything but the truth, nothing at all. It would just cause me to be lost. Even preachers are not concerned enough to tell people the truth. Don't they know that they're going to have to give an account for everybody that sits under the sound of their voice and that their blood will literally be required at their hands? I'm too afraid not to tell you the truth. I really am. But I don't want to go to hell because I wouldn't tell you the truth. And it will be said, and it is plain. I'll never go to hell because I was afraid of hurting your feelings. That is for sure. 
And we'll thank you for it one of these days. When we all get on the glory land shore, as the song says, you'll probably, man, you'll just run up and just hug my neck. Man, I'm glad you told me just how that it was. And by the same token, I'd hate to be in hell with some of these other preachers. Man, not only are they going to burn, they're going to be beat on for eternity. I mean, if I listen to a preacher and he led me to hell, I'd track him down in hell if I could. I would. You lying devil, you. I'm not sure where I would. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne. That's Jesus Christ saying, Amen and Hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants. Again, these are people that are already in heaven. And ye that fear him, both small and great. And again, these two scriptures prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that there will be a pre-tribulation rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. Verse 6 and 7. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And again, that is none other than Jesus Christ himself. I'm telling you folks, there is no doubt whatsoever in my mind that we are not right. Now, a lot of people don't know if they're right or not, and they wonder if they are right or not, but I am telling you that there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that we, the apostolic movement, we are 100% right. And the reason why we're only 100% right is because you can't get more right than that. We are right, and they are wrong whether they want to accept that or not. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife. Right now, we are the bride. Our next step will be, after the rapture of the church, we become his wife. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. There are two purposes for the seven years of great tribulation. Number one is he's going to return back to the nation of Israel during that time who are still on this earth during that seven year period. To redeem them because of his promise to Abraham, number one. Number two, the Gentile bride, whom we are, must be raptured out of here to be married. And that seven year period in heaven will be the marriage supper of the Lamb, a feast for seven years. In ancient Israel, after a Jewish wedding, they would have a seven-day feast, a type of this great tribulation on earth and marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. It all fits like a glove to the hand when you believe the pre-tribulation doctrine that we teach. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. The saints that are in heaven. This chapter is filled with proofs that there are people in heaven during the time of the seven-year great tribulation period. And the post-tribulation teachers don't have an answer for that, or at least they've never given me an answer for it. Because according to their doctrines, there's nobody in heaven right now. Nobody. Now we know that the souls of them that go on are in paradise, but they've not yet received a glorified body. 
Now, when the Bible references people here and saints here, this is after the resurrection. They have now received their glorified bodies and are in heaven conscious celebrating the marriage supper of the Lamb. There is where we become his wife. Verse 9. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that is all of us. God has called each and every one of us. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. There is nothing more true than God's Word. Nothing at all. And you can hang your salvation upon God's Word. This is true. That's why the Bible says, let every man be a liar, let God be true. He knew there would be people, there would be uh, ministries, there would be different theologies, theories and ideals concerning the Word of the Lord which would develop into different doctrines, different denominations, and different ways. He knew that. That's why that we have this book. That when someone tries to convince you that they're right and you're wrong, then let the word of the Lord be just. If they try to tell us that there are three persons in the Godhead, ask them to show you. Or the scripture says that there are three persons that make up a triune Godhead. When they tell us that we are baptized wrong, because both of us can't be right. I mean, either we're right and they're wrong, or they're right and we're wrong. I mean, that's just common sense. Ask them to show me one person in Scripture that was ever baptized using the titles of Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And they can't show you anyone. I've already searched the book to find out if I could, I would be debating someone and all of a sudden they pull out a scripture out of, a, out of one of these chapters that says Stephen or James or John or Peter baptized using the formula in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost. But I already searched the book. It's not that. Neither is anywhere in the lids of this book where, where it references God as in three persons. They can't win this debate. Verse 10. And I fell at his feet. This was John. Now understand, the Lord himself is speaking to an angel. And the angel is in turn revealing these things to John. That's how that it works. He said he sent and signified it to his servant John by the angel of the Lord. And John sees this angel. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou, do it not. I am thy fellow servant. Angels are servants of God too. And of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And without going into any depth on that subject, because we teach a Bible study when we teach on the gifts of the Spirit, just exactly what the, the spirit of prophecy is and how that it differs from the gift of prophecy. And there is a major difference between the gift of prophecy, which many don't understand, and the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And we not only can but we have proved that throughout Scripture that the spirit of prophecy is the receiving of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The gift of prophecy is a prophetic utterance given by the Holy Ghost, where there is for edification, um, prophecy itself, foretelling of a future event, uh, exhortation, whatever it may be. So understand that, that when the spirit of prophecy is referenced in the Bible, it is speaking of people that has received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. 
And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. Now it has come time in the great tribulation. It's coming to an end. The seven years are about to expire. And now the Lord makes his appearance. In verse 11 of Revelation chapter 19, the Lord John sees him returning from heaven to earth. In that day he will plant his feet upon the Mount of Olives. He will return to fight the battle of Armageddon. Actually, to end the battle of Armageddon. The place over there where he has gathered all nations together against Jerusalem to battle, for they will seek to destroy her. Half of the city will go into captivity. Thousands upon thousands of Jews will be slaughtered. And then, when it looks like that Jerusalem is going to be completely destroyed and the Jewish people completely annihilated, then the Lord steps out and fights for them as he did, the Bible says, in the day of battle, the days of Jehoshaphat and the days of David and the great warriors of God. John literally sees heaven open and he sees this white horse rider or he is symbolized as riding a white horse. And then it reveals who he is. He's called faithful and true. Jesus said, I am the truth, didn't he? And in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. How can they not see that this is Jesus? St. John 1 and 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We know that that was Jesus Christ. St. John 1 and 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, And the Word that was made flesh was God. That's why they'll be without excuse on Judgment Day. Because anyone that believes the Trinity believes a lie. Anyone that preaches or teaches the Trinity teaches and preaches a lie. And the Bible says all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. The Bible is revealing to us, to readers, who it is that returns. We know it's Jesus Christ. Now listen at verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him. That's these people that we've been reading about. These saints that we've been reading about that was praising God in heaven, the Bible says. It is absolutely fact that there's going to be a pre-tribulation rapture. There is no doubt. And there's a lot of things. There there are things in Bible prophecy that I do wonder about, but the rapture's not one of them. And it being a pre-tribulation rapture is not one of them. It is a biblical fact that there will be a pre-tribulation rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. And we will be called up into heaven to celebrate for seven years the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then we will come back from heaven with Him on white horses, the Bible says. And we are referred to as an army. Does not the Bible call us soldiers? Endure hardness as good soldiers, Apostle Paul said. Soldiers are in armies. We are these armies of Revelation 19 and 14. That was rapture. And we come back with the Lord Jesus, depicted as riding on white horses. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, 
clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. You see, after that seven years, when the Lord comes back from heaven, and we, the church of Jesus Christ, comes with him, it is to bring to conclusion the battle of Armageddon and to redeem the nation of Israel. And after that seven years, we'll end the 6,000-year period of time on earth and then we'll begin the 1,000-year millennial reign with Jesus Christ here on earth, where we will rule and reign with him for 1,000 years. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he shall smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. This word that we're reading about is Almighty God, who is Jesus Christ. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Who is that? Trinitarian people are so confusing, even in their preaching and teaching, they'll refer to Jesus as King of kings, but not the Almighty God. When the Bible references God in the Old Testament as king, a king of kings means that he is the greatest of all kings. And we know this is a title that Jesus Christ has, King of kings and Lord of lords. If they were three there, Jesus would need a boss, would he? Because he's Lord of lords. So if there is truly a father sitting on the throne, the Bible refers to the father as Lord. Many times throughout Scripture, God is referred to as the Lord God. And then we know that Jesus Christ the Bible says of him that same Jesus was made both Lord and Christ. And we know that the Holy Ghost is called Lord. For the Bible says, for the Lord is that spirit. But here it says, this person on this white horse is not only king of kings, but he's Lord of lords. That makes him the boss of the three. Yet, Trinity says that there's not one of them boss, but they all three boss together. Or they all three have authority together. That is so false. That is so easy to refute. There is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One God, who is the Father of all, above all, through all, and in you all, Ephesians 4, 4, 5, and 6. No wonder they'll be without excuse. Now, there's something in these verses that we read from 11 through 16 proves the teaching that I teach of a twofold coming of the Lord is true. And what that means is, I teach that the Lord is coming back twice. First, in the clouds to rapture his church when only the church will see him. And then he's coming back when every eye shall see him. And the Bible proves this out. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1 through 5. He said, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. That's the battle of Armageddon. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, 
and half of the city shall go into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth. Zechariah 14.3 is the same as Revelation 19.11 through 15. The same. Zechariah saw the same thing that John saw only 2,500 years later. Or not 2,500, but 500 years later. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Where did he leave from? In Acts chapter 1. Mount of Olives. And the two angels that stand by said, This same Jesus you see go away, come in like manner as you seen him go away, back to the same place. But the rapture, his feet never touches ground. Here it does. A specific distinction in the two comings of the Lord one in the clouds, one on earth. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach into Zeal. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzra king of Judah, and the Lord my God shall come. That's that Bible's writer. The Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with him. Absolute. How anyone cannot see that the saints of the church is raptured into heaven and comes back with him after seven years is beyond me. Jude 1, verse 14 and 15. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, and he's speaking of the, Jude 1, 14 and 15, is the same as Revelation 19, 11 through 16, and Zechariah 14, 1 through 5. And Enoch also said from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, the end, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, of all their harsh speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. The return of the Lord. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Now that tells us too. If Jesus ain't God, when was God ever pierced? There wasn't but one whose piercing is significant to us, and that is Jesus Christ. And that's when the Roman soldier walked by that cross and to make sure that he was dead, took a spear and plunged it into his side. And it brought forth blood and water. That is Jesus Christ. And behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. And the key there is, every eye shall see him. As opposed to him coming when nobody sees him but the church. Now, to show you the difference, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18. Now, this, this, this sequence of scriptures details the rapture. The three tribulation coming of the Lord. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. How clear that it is. 
For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. The post-tribulation teachers confuse that word shout with because it is used that everybody's going to hear it. Not so. Only the dead in Christ will hear it. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. The other one, they're coming down. How many sees that? There's a difference between, whether they know it or not, going up and coming down. Two completely different directions. Is that not true? In this coming of the Lord, He does not come to earth, and the saints come up to meet Him. In the pre three previous passages of Scripture that we read, the Lord comes down with His saints. How much clearer than that can you get? You can't get any clearer than that. For we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The other one, the, the Mount of Olives. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. See, I can comfort you tonight. And as bad as the world is, and as evil that it is, and the end is near, we can take comfort in knowing that we're going to escape the wrath of God. I'm glad for that, ain't you? I'm glad that we don't have to go through all the things that we've read up in this book of Revelation. Now, I couldn't comfort you if I have to look out here and tell you they're going to chop your head off. They're going to parade you in front of your children and tell you if you don't take the mark of the beast, they're going to kill you and your children. There's nothing comforting about that, is there? Nothing at all. These post-tribulation teachers are so mixed up. I used to say they're, they're way out in left field, but now I say they're not even in the ballpark. That's right. As to being right, they never was so far from the truth as to teach that doctrine. Question. Where will this battle of Armageddon take place? Joel chapter 3, verse 22. For behold, in those days, and Joel prophesied of the same thing as Zechariah, John, and Enoch, for behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations, is that not what Zechariah said? And will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. The valley of Jehoshaphat is right outside Jerusalem, known also as the Valley of Jezreel and also the Valley of Megiddo. It's uh, outside Jerusalem there, a big valley, a plain, where many, many battles have taken place down through uh, ancient biblical history, and great victories have been won. And that's where the battle will take place of Armageddon. Back to Revelation, verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together to the supper of the great God. And he's making reference to all that have been killed, the hundreds of thousands that will be slaughtered in the valley of Megiddo, that the birds will feast on their flesh. That ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And that beast here is the Antichrist. 
And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And this is when Israel will be redeemed. And then uh, the 1,000 year millennial reign where Jesus Christ will begin to fulfill all Bible prophecy. For in the Lord said that in that day that he would return and build again the tabernacle of David. Or in other words, the kingdom of David. And that he himself would come and sit on the throne of his father, David. That's what Jesus said. Jesus refers to David as his father according to the flesh. They called Jesus one of his titles. Jesus, thou son of David. It's going to happen just like the Bible says. All right, you can have a song. Bible prophecy is actually pretty clear when it's studied out in its context, rightly divided. And certainly the book of Revelation, neither the book of Daniel, is books to not be read, but there are books to be read and studied, preached and taught, that the people might know the signs of the end times, that we might be ready when the Lord comes. And that is why that we was given all of this that we would make ourselves ready. And when the Lord comes, we'll be ready to go back with Him because all that are left behind at the rapture, there are Gentile nations cannot and will not be saved. Next week, then, Lord's will.